Well, good morning, Meadowbrook. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. Again, my name is Brian. A special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. So uh, like it said in the video, we're going to do something a little unique today. I I don't know if um, you guys have like connected the dots with how long we've been in Romans, but we started studying Romans last fall, the beginning of last fall. So that means we have spent over a year in Romans. And I, I will say, I'm really glad that we, we did it. Um, we did it, guys. We did it. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I can remember a conversation I had with my dad. It's about three years ago, and I was working through, like, oh, what should I preach next? And kind of planning some things out. He's like, you should do the book of Romans. And I laughed at him because I was like, Dad, the only people who suggest that you teach through the book of Romans are people who've never read through the book of Romans because it's one of the more intimidating books in the Bible to preach through. And I don't know how many, you know, weeks technically we did, but it was probably, you know, well over 50 or so. And uh, I don't know if, if churches these days are going that deep into, like, one book of the Bible. And so for, for me, I just feel like, wow, like, it's been a great journey to really understand what some people say is one of the most important books in the Bible, and sometimes when churches like have big sermon series like that, you finish it, and then like the next week you're just on to the next thing, and it's like, we did that, check. But I thought it'd be really helpful for us to spend just one more week just kind of sitting in it and, and asking the question, like, what, what did studying this book mean for us as a church? So, so maybe you've been here the whole time. Maybe you were with us last year when we started. Maybe you've just started coming this fall. But my hope is that Everybody who engaged in any part of this book found it to be meaningful and insightful and transformational. You know, the, the last part of this series we called Transformed because Paul says in chapter 12, verse 1, be transformed. The, the call for us as Christians is to be transformed, is to be changed. The longer that you're walking with Jesus, hopefully your life starts to look more like Jesus. Jesus. And if you were to rewind the clock on your life five years ago, ten years ago, or even one year ago, hopefully your life looks different today than it did then. And one of the things that the scriptures tell us is the way that we are transformed, especially in Romans, is by the renewing of our mind. And, And we believe that the scriptures have power. And the more we engage with the scriptures, they are a catalyst to change and transformation in our life. And so what we're going to do this morning is uh, we have four individuals who are going to come up, and they're just going to share some stories and some testimony about how studying the book of Romans has impacted them over the last year. And so I'm going to go ahead and invite our our first friend. This is uh, my friend Aaron. And um, join me in just welcoming Aaron up front. And so, so we're going to make this somewhat conversational, um, just a, a way for, for you to kind of share how this journey has been for you. And why don't you start just by introducing yourself? Uh, so my name is Aaron Dirks. Um, I am married to Shannon. Uh, we have two, three kids, excuse me. Uh, you forget after, forget, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I get that. Um, six, my, no, my son Noah is six, uh, my daughter Avery is four, and my little guy Charlie is 16 months. They're the ones usually wearing Vikings things, so Ooh. sorry, I'm not sorry about <laughs> that one. Um, but yeah, that's us. We've yeah. been here for four years. Yeah, and so. how, how are you guys involved in terms of like, in, in just the different things that you do here? Yeah, so um, my wife and I help out with the kids' ministry from time to time, and we're also involved in a neighborhood community as well. That's great. Yeah. So, so let's just jump in, and maybe you could say, as we think about the book of Romans as a whole, was there um, along the way, was there a passage or a section of the book of Romans that was impactful for you and why? I'm going to go on a little tangent right great. off the okay. bat, though. Um, so echoing kind of what you said earlier, so I'm a Marquette grad, so if there's any others, hooray Marquette. Um, we had to take two theology classes. Hmm. So there was like an intro to theology, and then you could pick from a various topic Mm -hmm. that you wanted. So I picked the New Testament. So we studied the whole New Testament. And at the end, we had to do some sort of research paper, whatever paper. It was the final project. And you had to pick one book 
from the New Testament, and I thought it would be a great idea to pick Romans. <laughs> Because something in it really connected with me at the time. And believe me, not a great idea. I can see why you took a year plus yeah. to yeah. study the book because that was one of the harder papers that yeah. I had written in my college career. So there's yeah. my little tangent. It came full circle. Yeah, there to, you go. I'm sure this series like completely illuminated it all for you and yeah. answered all your questions. Yeah, I yeah. could go back and yeah. write my you paper could. better. Yeah. Um, Speaking to that, I think when, since becoming a dad, I've, I've kind of read scripture a lot differently, mm -hmm. and I think it's, it's changed my perspective on a lot of kind of just reading through various topics in the Bible. And so the topic or the passage that I connected the most with was Romans 8, 37 through 39. Do you want me to read Yeah, it? that'd be great. Okay. So it says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is Christ, that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I think for me, it's very impactful because that's such a future, like the future can't even take us from God, mm -hmm. right? And so, again, since becoming a parent, I think to myself, you know, I'm still in kind of the little kid years, so there's part of it where it's just keeping them alive. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, my six-year-old, it's like I'm starting to try and make him a real person mm -hmm. and, like, kind and caring and compassionate to people. And I have this view of the future, and my view of the future is so small mm. in comparison to God's view mm -hmm. of the future because he's already there. He knows what's yeah. happening. And so for me, when I'm reading that, it's like how impactful is it that my plan has already been set? Mm -hmm. And that I can trust in that. Yeah. I think that's super impactful. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good, right? Like we, it, it kind of speaks to that idea of control, right? And we, we love control and we love to control the future even though like we're not even there. And somehow if we can like do things right in the here and now, we'll get there and it'll be right. But you know, we can't control it. But even in that, God still says we, we won't ever be separated from him. So how is studying Romans changed or deepened your understanding of who God is? Yeah, so I would say, again, kind of echoing the God, the Father. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's times in my life that I get very stuck in this idea that God's this, like, cosmic being that is ready to just smite, right, mm -hmm. at the minute that I do something wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and in reality, that's not true. Mm -hmm. I mean, he sees me, and he sees all of us as yeah. his children, and he loves us so deeply. Again, as a dad, mm -hmm. I'm not ready to smite my kid when mm -hmm. they do something wrong. Sometimes I feel like, you know, yeah. um, but there's that sense of like, I love you so much that I want you to be yeah. better. I want, I, I want to show my love to you in different ways. And I think God's always doing that. And so it's funny because a lot of times when I start prayers, I say, dear heavenly father, and I forget actually what yeah. I'm saying at times. Yeah. And in reality, it's like, he's our father and he loves us and he wants us to treat him that way. Yeah. Um, which, which is interesting because Romans starts pretty quick, like within the first chapter, like the wrath of God is being revealed, right? And so it's like, how do we understand the wrath of God? What is that? And how do we marry that with his love and who he is mm -hmm. as a father? And I think sometimes that if, you, if you've had a healthy father in your life, that can help frame how all of that, that fits yeah. together. Nice. Yeah. So um, w one other question. When you think about um, your, like, day-to-day -day living, maybe apart from your role as a dad, how have you found that Romans has impacted the way you think about living out your faith in the world? You know, I think it's just being able, looking at Romans as a whole, I think there was that idea of, of you know, we're sinful, mm -hmm. we need someone to save us, and we know the key to that salvation. And I think it's just being confident in that mm -hmm. and being able to live that in your day-to-day -day life. I think there's a lot of impact when you're able to just talk to people about it, but when you can actually show God's love to people mm -hmm. too and show him that we aren't perfect, we're all sinners and we need that salvation and we know the way to get there, like it can change your perception, change your way of interacting with yeah. people on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. So I think that's just impactful and, and, and it kind of empowers me to be able to live differently mm -hmm. because I know where my salvation comes from. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. I really appreciate your, your time and your effort in putting this together. So thanks so much for participating in this. Can you guys say thank you to Aaron? All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite Cammie to
to come on up. This is, uh, some of you may recognize Cammie. She sings on the worship team, but I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi there, I'm Cammie Gilbert. Um, I'm involved in the worship team from time to time. Uh, and sometimes I do a little bit of photography and mm-hmm. graphic design. Yeah. So. And how long have you guys been coming? T- say Since, a little bit uh, about your family, too. Who's yeah, so my husband, Matt, and I have two kids. Um, Micah's four, Emmett is two. You might also see Matt up here. He plays the drums. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been coming since uh, 2019. Mm-hmm. Yeah, about in, like summer 2019, yeah. right before COVID. <laughs> yep, I remember that. I remember yeah. meeting you guys. And uh, yeah. so, so you and I have had some conversations over the course of this series because I know that Romans has really been impactful yeah. for you. So say a little bit about like, you know, why and how that's been impactful for you. Sure. So anyone that knows me probably knows <laughs> that um, I, like, I really have a heart for the Jewish people. Um, and that, that's because for whatever reason, it was something I feel like God put on my heart from like a young age. But when I was in college, I studied in Israel and I was pretty much, um, like irrevocably intertwined with the Jewish people from that point forward. It was, um, just an amazing experience, but it's a, it's a lot, um, to chew on. I feel like there's a lot of question. Um, and so thus began my journey between like, why, why is the Bible so much about Jew and Gentile? Obviously, I'm not Gentile. Like, I'm not, I'm not Jewish. Um, and Romans 9 through 11 is largely about that. And mm-hmm. um, I was on my own sort of reprocessing a lot of things around the time that we hit that in Romans. So coincidence or not, not coincidence. Yeah. Um, and that, that section of the scriptures really talks about, like, what is the future? Yeah of the Jewish people. If Gentiles have brought, been brought in and the Jewish people were the chosen people, like what does that mean exactly. for their, their future? And Paul calls it like a great mystery. Yeah. Um, I think it's in Ephesians. He mm-hmm. might say that. I'm yep. not sure. Um, yep. He calls it a great mystery that Gentiles are brought into a Jewish story. And I think culturally, um, you know, like I didn't know anyone that was Jewish growing up. Uh, and just as like I, my life um, unfolded, I just didn't have any real exposure to a Jewish mindset or the Jewish story. Um, and so that was a big question for me, um, like why the Bible talks about that so much. And it, it kind of took some time to, to like gather the answer um, for some of those questions. But yeah, I do think in that section of Romans, he's talking about um, sort, of, sort of the end game, like what does... The plan of redemption look like, mm-hmm. um, specifically looking at uh, this like relationship between two people, um, and I think like the takeaway is that the the Jewish people are not removed from that plan, like just because the Gentiles are brought into it, that they're right. still um, there's some there's some um, really important fulfillment in them, like recognizing who who Jesus is, mm-hmm. um, and like I mean that out of love, like. I, here I am benefiting from who Jesus is, and I, I so, so desire to, like, share that with them because I yeah. feel immensely, like, grateful. Yeah. Um, yeah. So maybe you could say a little bit about how um, both this study has increased that desire and, and maybe even share a story of what it looks like for you to actually reach out to sure. Jewish friends of yours. Yeah. Um, well, I have a couple friends um, one of them, I got to talking with her about the gospel at one point. It was around Yom Kippur, um, which is the Day of Atonement, and explaining like who Jesus, who Jesus is, and like what he did. I was actually explaining why, um, like I love this holiday, but actually, like I, it's a holiday in Israel where people um, will say. Like, I wish you may be written into the book of life. Like, they have this greeting in Hebrew, like, I hope that you'll be written into the book of life and kind of explaining to her, like, I, you know, like, I believe I already am written into the book of life. And um, there's really, like, a lot of stuff to kind of unpack. That conversation was very, like, all over the place because I was, we were really covering a lot of ground, Mm -hmm. like, in a short time. (laughs) Um, But it was really cool to say, um, you know, this is like this person fulfills this sacrifice. Like he's a final Mm -hmm. sacrifice. He is a perfect keeper of the law. He gives himself um, 
he as like a absolute perfect atonement and there's no need to do anything other than like acknowledge it verbally yeah. and um does that answer your question i'm not sure yeah yeah you know i because I, 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 I think you're right when you see that jesus is the fulfillment and that's what paul is trying to do he's trying to show that jesus fulfills the story yeah and as he fulfills the story he brings gentiles in and that's part of their story back in isaiah it says you will be a light of revelation to the gentiles and so yeah. we are brought in and now you know as members of the family of god we have a responsibility to continue to to be that light both to gentiles and anybody who yeah. doesn't believe so. yeah and just how he's i see him using two groups of people to benefit each other like he really mm -hmm. used the Jewish people, um, they really bore this burden mm -hmm. for ages mm -hmm. of the Torah. And even though sometimes we, we can speak about the Israelites as maybe their flaws, um, I see them as really like being the only people who struggled to know God, to follow him in their surrounding culture and in the world. And the people who really bore like the truth mm -hmm. um, and then eventually giving me Jesus. Yeah. Um, and now in turn, I really want to, um, I really want to bless them, like however I'm able, obviously with the truth of Jesus. Um, but I also, I think part of that's like just wanting to show them gratitude. Yeah. Um, because, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really incredible. And I think yeah. the Bible's full of that yeah. sort of like duality between Jew and Gentile. And yeah. it's all over the place. Yeah, I, I, th I think you could say that the Jew-Gentile connection of coming into the family to God together, of God together is one of the top five yeah, main issues in the New Testament. Like the New Testament is trying to address how these two different groups of people become one yeah and if we could take that mindset of like okay like like you said two groups of people trying to understand how they benefit from each other and if we just had that mindset in general like there are people in this world who are always going to be different than us mm -hmm. and if we could look to find ways to connect with them even though they're different and say yeah how, how is it that we benefit from each other i think this world would be a much better place yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well thank you so much for yeah, sharing this morning Can you guys say thanks to cammy <laughs> All right, I'm going to invite my, my next friend to come on up. Um, this is Sal, and Sal has been coming here for a couple years. Um, it's been five, five fast years. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Sal Calura. I've been coming here for five years. As I just said, it was in the fall of 17. Uh, my wife, Mickey, who can't be here today, is my wife, and... Um, we love it here. <laughs> yeah, I feel like every time I see you walk through the door, like I get an instant hit of espresso or something. You just have <laughs> so much energy in life, and I love seeing you. So well, I, you, if anybody is here and they hear somebody go, mm-hmm, amen, out loud, it's probably you. Yeah. So tell me, and, I, and I've heard lots of amens from you over the last year, which I appreciate. So tell me like, just what studying Romans has meant to you. Yeah, man, I'll tell you. Um, I've been walking with the Lord for about 40 years, and I feel I know less now than I knew back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's incredible how this book and how the Lord just continues to work in our lives as we, as we walk with him. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the things that really um, hit me was um, a divided world needs to see a unified church. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the mantra, a lot of the theme that was going on was the bickering between the Jewish believers and the Christian believers. And um, I, really, I, I really saw that in myself because I like to be right. Mm. You know, Anybody else identify with that? I like yeah. to be right. Yeah. You know, and it, it really just um, it showed me that you don't have to be right, Sal, all the time. Mm -hmm. you know? Being unified with your brother and sister is more important than mm -hmm. you being right. Mm -hmm. So it was really convicting to me. So that, that brought me to, um, we, all, we all know that I think Paul eloquently talks to us about, in Romans 6, 7, and 8, mm -hmm. the struggle we have with being in Christ, having this gift of salvation, understanding what the cross did for us, and yet between our ears, we struggle with thoughts, we struggle with, um, you know, contempt mm -hmm. towards people. Uh, not everybody likes Brussels sprouts, yeah. and I'm sure... <laughs> Uh, but a lot of people do. But we're, we, we're different. Mm -hmm. we, we, come, we come into this body, we, we fellowship together, and yet 
it's so important that we're in Christ and in the Spirit. So yeah. Paul, at the, at, um, in Romans 8 there, he says, therefore, there's no condemnation to mm -hmm. those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, and that really, I think he said that because we all can relate that a lot of times we're knuckleheads and we mm -hmm. fall into chapter 6 of Romans and we just, we have stinking thinking. Mm -hmm. And we need to realize that he, you know, in spite of our stinking thinking, he still loves me. Yeah. And there isn't any condemnation to me. I need to grow. I need to mm -hmm. get better with that. Um, but the bottom line is he's there for us. And, and unity is what I see being the key. Yeah. You know, he wants us to be together, not to be divided. Yeah. You know, like I said, we don't all paint with the same brush. We don't all like Brussels sprouts. But we're in this together. We're yeah. in Christ. And that's the key. Yeah, I think you're right. A, a divided world needs to see a united church. And I think that's one way that we bear witness to the redemptive work of Jesus in our life. When you're different, I'm different, we come from different backgrounds, but yet we find commonality in Jesus. It sometimes blows people's minds. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and let's face it, I mean, the world's always been divided. I think, I think COVID really hit, a, hit us with a whammy that mm -hmm. we saw a little more of the dividedness, yeah. even, even amongst churches. Yep. And, um, and again, everything's got to point to him. And yeah. what's it like to be in Christ? You yeah. know? So how, how are you now finding that kind of that, like, hey, I don't always have to be right. Like, it's part of my responsibility to nurture unity. How are you finding that actually working its way into the way that you live on a daily basis? Well, <laughs> that's a million dollar question. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, it really is, and I'm sorry, what's his brother's name that was leading us this morning in song? Kyle. Kyle. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we all know Romans 12, 1 and 2, but, you know, really, he mentioned before he sang, what are we putting in our heads, mm -hmm. you know, um, because what, what goes in comes out a lot mm -hmm. of times, and uh, the importance of, of taking in the Word of God mm -hmm. into our lives and mm -hmm. then letting it, letting it control us. Mm -hmm. And then that, that to me is, is really the key. And what I'm striving to do it in my walk with the Lord is not to strive, but let him have his way. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a life that's really like surrendering yourself to the Lord and say, okay, I want to practice hearing from you to respond to you so that I can ultimately yeah. submit my life to you. Yeah. That's great. Well, I really appreciate you coming up and being a part of this conversation today. So can you guys say thanks to, Thank you. to Sal? Thank you. Right. All right, so we have one more individual who's going to come up. I'm going to invite uh, Ellie to join me up here. So I'm going to go ahead and let you introduce yourself, too. I'm Ellie Skorczewski. Um, my husband, Alex, and I have been coming here for eight or nine years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you have how many kids? Uh -huh, almost four. Almost. <laughs> yeah. That's how we're involved in the church is we're providing children for the children's right. ministry. <laughs> we appreciate that. Yeah. And you also serve on our missions yeah, team. Yes, I'm on the so, missions team as well. <laughs> yeah. So, so tell me for you what uh, studying Romans has kind of meant for you. I Because mean, I remember you very early on, you're like, hey, I really like this. This is I really do, it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. One of the things that I've really taken from this Roman study as a whole is actually... Um, the background of the letter, a lot of it, weirdly, um, that it was written to the Roman church, which I forget who mentioned it, but it was, you know, the Roman church was about the size of our congregation. Yeah, even smaller, probably about 100 yeah, people. Yeah, 100 people. Um, and just be like, wow, like, what a cool thing that Paul wrote this letter to a group of 100 people. Yeah. And the and that would have been the only church in yes, Rome. Like, yeah, that's yeah, it. a huge, huge city that yeah. had a ton of influence. Um, and just then the deep theology that came from it and kind of what Sal was saying, just like the unity of the church um, and how important that was if it was going to reach the rest of the world. Yeah. So. Was there any passage or section of the letter that really like stuck out to you as we worked through it? All of it. Um, <laughs> no, um, I mean, Romans 12, I think is, I think stood out the most. Um, and actually that was a, a, I memorized that whole chapter in elementary can school. Can you recite it for yeah, us today? I, I can. I, I, I can remember all the verses. <laughs> I um, but again, having memorized it as a little kid, whenever I read through it, then I, mm -hmm. it kind of just, you know, it's Comes memory, back. it's memory yeah. then. And so, you know, again, actually studying from it. And I, I wrote down the, the list um, from the 
from the sermon, you know, middle of 12, in the middle of chapter 12, but some of the virtues, um, humbleness, do, are we humble? Do we serve? Are we passionate? Do we have integrity? Are we perseverant? Are we hospitable? Are we peaceable? Um, is compassion a motivator for us? Are we prayerful? Are we devoted to one another? Are we joyful? Are we, are we forgiving? And do we love our enemies? And when you mm -hmm. said that, I was like, man. Um, and you said that wasn't like a checklist that we needed to yeah. do. It was Paul casting a vision. And again, then thinking about it as a church, do we do this? Like, do mm -hmm. we all have these qualities, you know, put together? Because, you know, where I might lack in some of these, another member of mm -hmm. our church doesn't. And so we can teach each other, we can help each other. But, you know, this is the vision for the church that we would be bound together in these, these principles. Yeah. And that we're not the, the lone rangers. Right. Right? We right. have to be in community. Yeah. Because so. on days when I'm not very compassionate... Hopefully, I got you covered. You're right, yeah. you can. I can borrow. I can borrow yes. some of your compassion yeah. on a given day. Yeah. And so, yeah, just, we we need each other because mm -hmm. that's like a, that's an intense list. Like oh, when yeah. you when you read through that chapter in Romans 12, and Paul lists out all these things. This is who you are called to be. Mm -hmm. And he leads into that saying, "Be transformed." Like yes. essentially, be this kind of person. How right? we do that is Romans one or twelve one and two is yeah. that we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. Yeah. So are we in scripture? Are yeah. we? in community, are we encouraging one another yeah. to go towards these virtues? Yeah. So can you, would you be able to name a way, this is like an off the script Sorry. question, name a way that you feel like studying Romans has helped you renew your mind and you've actually seen that work itself out in some sort of transformation? Um, I think, again, kind of looking at this list and then again, raising small children that yeah. are just a bunch of sinners and it's very <laughs> obvious. <laughs> um, but again, I see, you know, I see those, those selfish motivators, those, you know, ways we easily fall into sin. Um, and so again, then going back to reading Romans, the deep theology of it, um, it's, again, at the end of the day, who am I to God? I'm his child. Mm -hmm. I'm adopted. I was grafted in. Mm -hmm. um, and again, how does that change the way that I interact with others? So again, the tangible way is, again, with parenting, you know, am I, am I humble in my parenting? Am I, you know, mm -hmm. after a rough day, mm -hmm. Alex and I talk about Oh, we didn't really handle that situation yeah. well. You know, like, wh what's, our, what's our goal with raising our children is that they know Christ. It's how are we, you know, showing them that. You know, mm -hmm. are we compassionate with them? Are we humble? Are we prayerful? Yeah. Um, and so, again, I think it's just the intentionality of that. Are we rooted in Scripture? You know, is yeah. that what we're coming back to? So, yeah, I mean, it's not a super tangible way. But, again, just more the, the thought process of, like, what are my motivators yeah. in yeah my actions and parenting and I work in the ER. So there's a lot of interesting folk that come in and, yeah. um, but again, those interactions, how am I, you know, living out yeah. what Paul is writing about in Romans. Yeah. So, so one, one other question for you. Um, a lot of what Paul does in Romans is he's always calling back to stuff from the old yeah. Testament, right? So I think, Paul is trying to show how this letter and this movement mm -hmm. connects to what all has come before. So yeah. has studying Romans given you a, a, a deeper sense or a bigger sense of like the scriptures as a whole? So it's funny because we've been um, studying Romans and I do Bible study fellowship and mm -hmm. we're doing like the prophets of the Old Testament, yeah. <laughs> which I've never really studied before. So again, seeing you know, the, uh, like Cam was saying, like the Torah, like all the rules that had to be followed and then the fulfillment of those that came through Jesus. Yeah. Um, again, seeing maybe more of the, the wrath of God mm. that you see, you know, in parts of the New Testament. Obviously, there's lots of points where God is gracious, gracious and loving, but then um, how it's connected to the New Testament of now we, we can claim Jesus. You know, mm -hmm. he died for our sins. And um, a quote that I heard kind of recently in this last year was, you know, we we have to provoke God to anger. Like, God mm. is love. Mm. Um, and he gives his love freely. Um, and, and he has to be provoked mm -hmm. to anger. And it's it, not his natural response. It, exactly. It's it's, so, um, seeing, you know, studying the Old Testament, seeing 
you know, the rules, the law, the regulations, and then seeing how Christ fulfilled those so we don't have to. Yeah. So we just have to accept him. Yeah. So. That's great. Yep. Well, thank you again yep. for being a part of this. Yep. So can you guys say thanks to Ellie? Yeah. So we're going to jump right in. And I'm going to invite my friend Chris to come on up front. Um, and we're just going to have a, a, a short conversation. There's four individuals today who are going to uh, share a little bit. And Chris is the lucky winner to go yeah. first. So Chris, why don't you go ahead and just uh, introduce yourself. Tell them how long you've been coming to Meadowbrook Church and just some of the ways that you're involved here. So I'm Chris Worth. Um, my wife, Mary, and I have been coming here uh, for, I think, close to 14 years now. But um, we uh, got involved slowly in different things, and then we um, became members three years ago. And um, in the meantime, we got involved in a neighborhood community about eight years ago, and then I started co-facilitating that and Mary and I hosting it mm -hmm. at our house uh, for about the last four years. So that's really important to us. And then um, we started the, a men's ministry or restarted the men's ministry here uh, about four and a half years yeah. ago. And that's been great. Uh, it's called the Band of Brothers. So we're, we're Bob. <laughs> and, uh, and then um, I've been involved for about seven years in a small... Um, Bible study. It's all men, so I don't know if that's a men's Bible study, but it's a small study, and um, it's just been great. There, too, we call ourselves men of the book. <laughs> so. Nice. So as we've worked through Romans over this last year plus, um, what has been a part of the script of uh, that book that has been impactful for you? What, what has stood out for you? Um, well, like you said, it's a very challenging book, and you, you gave us a lot of credit, said we got through it, but you, know, I mean, you got through it, so... Um, you hung in there with me, which, yeah, is, yeah, which is a lot. Yeah, um, it, The challenging... Well, I, in, really, in fairness, the whole thing is challenging, and you, I think, really uh, parsed it out in a way that was helpful, kept us interested and challenged... Mm -hmm. You know, um, trying to remember the, the book itself. If there's some big overall thing I could say about it, but I'm it's all right. missing. Is there is there one specific section that really stood out to you, or one chapter, or one passage yeah. that was really meaningful for you? Well, well, I thought you know there's 16 chapters, and, and chapter eight starts out with my favorite verse, which is therefore there is now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, and. Uh, that I just thought was really neat because it was right at a, the centerpiece. Yeah. Um, and then in that same chapter 8, there was uh, probably one of my maybe even a more favorite passages, 828, I think it says, uh, so um, all things work for good. Mm -hmm. God causes all things to work for good for those who love him and live according yeah. to his purposes. And I just thought how interesting it was to, to see how the first seven chapters, he just went through this, all this in-depth theology and doctrine about, uh, you know, the atonement and the flesh and the spirit and all these things um, that uh, sort of led to that final thing. And then I just remember how you handled that sermon, mm -hmm. uh, with no condemnation, mm -hmm. um, and you just pounded it home. <laughs> and it was a great feeling, feeling yeah. for me of that sense of we are no longer um, are going to be paying the price for our sin. Yeah. Cuz I think oftentimes we have this voice in our head, right? Like we have this inner critic who continually condemns us and puts shame upon us and it's easy to be right. uh, living in that cycle in that story and sometimes we need a word like that to break that yeah. cycle to Yeah. And then by the end of that chapter it's saying that everything works for good. Yeah. So um, we know that even our trials and sufferings and pain work for good for yeah. those who love God and live yeah. according to His yeah. How How has studying Romans maybe grown or deepened your understanding of who God is and the good news that comes through the gospel? Um, well, what I thought, again, there's so many parts to it, but I really enjoyed um, 
understanding uh, Paul's mission to the Gentiles. Mm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's all of us, unless you were brought up in a Jewish home or something, you know, and have ancestry. Uh, we're Gentiles. And uh, the effort he made, the amount of help he needed, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the persecution he went through, and all mm -hmm. these things, really for us today. Yeah. It, it, I, I felt that's kind of how that impacted me. Yeah, because we're, we're still a part of that, that line in that story, and without the message going to the Gentiles, you know, where, yeah, where would we be today? Yeah, yeah that's good. So how have you found that studying this book has uh, impacted the way you think about living out your faith on a day-to-day -day basis in the world that we inhabit? Yeah. Um, well, I think the book gives me a sense that there's a purpose bigger than me mm -hmm. and bigger than any one individual person uh, except Jesus himself. Yeah. And um, so just uh, contemplating and, and meditating on that um, I think is, is an important part of, of anybody's life if they're, you know, humble and trying to be humble and and, and, and live well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we live in a very me-centric world, and the culture is always telling, it's about you, it's about you, it's about you. And I think Paul, all throughout the New Testament, helps us see it's, it's not really about us. It's about Jesus and what he has done and what he is still doing yeah. in our lives today. That's good. Yeah, well, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to, to share a little bit and just kind of open up how studying Romans has impacted you. So can you guys all say thanks to Chris for just being a part of this today? Yeah. And I'm going to go ahead and, and invite uh, our next uh, storyteller, Anne, to, to come on up and give her testimony of how Romans has impacted her faith. So go ahead and, and introduce yourself as well. I'm Anne Carlin. Uh, my husband, Brett, and I have been attending Meadowbrook for almost two years now. And um, I'm involved in tapestries, women's ministry. I serve in the toddler room during the Sunday school hour. And Brett and I also are currently mentoring a young couple mm -hmm. that's planning on getting married in the spring. Yeah, that's great. Well, go ahead and, and start by just sharing like what's, what studying Romans meant to you this past year. So you asked, Chris, the passage, yeah. maybe section that was most impactful. And I would have to say for me, the section that really spoke to me was um, Romans 6, 15 through mm. 23, mm. because it really talks about Jesus giving us a supernatural sense of self-worth that mm. comes from his mercy and compassion and not yeah. anything that I do. Yeah. So maybe say why that really struck you in, in that way. Well, because I've struggled with perfectionism my mm. whole life. Anybody else? Any, anybody else? Yeah, yeah. I've sought, you know, acceptance and mm. being recognized as worthy by mm. achievements and, like, how well I do things. And um, it's not about, like you just said before, it's not about me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's one thing that, um, you know, it's interesting when you, when you get deep, because like, you could read Romans and just be like, it's dense and there's a lot of theology there, but then it, you can really find that it boils down to really practical, like, things that we can actually integrate into our lives to help us think differently about who we are, yeah. The other thing that was humbling is I accepted the Lord as a sophomore in high school, and that was a long time ago. Not, not that long ago, though. Not that long ago. But that truth about my self-esteem was driven home in a new way. Hmm, Yeah. Meaning in, in recent, recent months. Meaning I've, I've read Romans before. Yeah. I've heard messages yeah. about Romans. And it really, this is the first time I really felt convicted that mm. your tendency to strive for perfectionism is not just a character flaw. It's actually, it's sin in my life. Mm. Yeah. Which highlights that, like, we're always growing. Yes. Like, yeah. we're always learning. Yep. Like, the, the road of our own transformation is never done, right? We will never be fully transformed either until Jesus takes us home or he returns. And so there's always something for us to be learning 
about ourselves. And, and to say that, like, striving for perfection is sin could be like, what? Like, that's a, like, really? Is it? You know? Well, I think um, I realized in a new way that it was limiting mm. what God wanted to do in my life. Yeah, and I think there's a passage in Romans, I think it's near the end, that says anything that comes not from faith is, is sin. And so I think sometimes we have this perception of sin that, like, it's this bad, bad thing, which, right, it is. But I think when we can understand, like, God loves us, receives us, even in light of our sin, it frees us mm -hmm. to name it yep. and to see how pervasive it is in our own life. And that's not the thing that defines us, right. but it's his love. Right. So, so through all that, as, as that was a realization for you, um, how did you feel like God was revealing himself to you in that? In terms of like, how did you see God as you had that revelation? Well, I think as Christians that are involved in a fellowship, we tend to define our worth in the body by mm. what people think. Mm. Um, and it really should be based on where God is leading us mm -hmm. and what he wants to accomplish. And so how we engage shouldn't be defined by what people think. It should mm -hmm. be defined by where do I see God leading me? Yeah. Are you, are you able to name like how that realization has actually worked itself out in your your day-to-day -day life like the last question I, I gave you was how has Romans impacted the way you think about living your faith in the world today so in light of that have you been able to identify how it's changed the way you actually work in the world so I think um, that we all would agree that the pandemic has changed people it's mm -hmm. changed us and it's changed people in the world around us that might not be believers and I think there's a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's incredible power in being the hands and feet of Jesus. So mm -hmm. I retired a year ago, a little over a year ago, from a demanding career in healthcare. Um, and after I retired, I was trying to define okay, how do I continue to be fruitful, mm -hmm. um, even though I'm not working? Mm -hmm. um, and so. Being involved in volunteering at the Ronald McDonald House, which is a charity in southeastern Wisconsin that allows people to stay at that facility that have children that are involved in getting long-term care at children's hospitals. So some of those families are there for sometimes as long as three to six months. Mm. Um, and what I do there is very simple and very menial. I clean the kitchens. Mm. There's seven kitchens at the Ronald McDonald House and every other week I'm there cleaning the kitchen. But um, I guess where I'm going with this is even in the most routine of activities, there's a way to um, be loving mm -hmm. and engage um, and, and, and share, you know, what we've come to realize. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. It reminds me of what Paul says. I think it's in chapter 12 where he says, love must be sincere, right? Our, our, like where he's driving with all of the theology on the front end is that hopefully your understanding of who God is turns you into a person who loves mm -hmm. and loves in sincere ways, even doing things that maybe people never even see you do. Right. So, yeah. Exactly. Well, thanks so much Thank for you. all that you shared. We really appreciate it. Can you guys say thanks to Anne? I'm going to invite uh, Jeff to come on up next. Um, Jeff has been at our church for a couple years. I had the privilege of marrying he and his wife, which was a joy. And now we get to have you share with us. So just introduce yourself a little bit more about how long you've been here and kind of how you're engaged in ministry at our church. Yeah, so um, I would say spring, early summer of 2020 mm -hmm. um, is when me and Laura... Uh, reached out to Brian, never having attended Meadowbrook or anything, um, but we reached out. We lived just down the block at Hawthorne Terrace. We're looking for a church. Obviously, basically no churches were open at the right. time, um, but we at, reached out to Brian just, you know, would you be interested or, um, you know, would know we haven't attended. It's a bit unconventional, but would you do our wedding? And um, just from the beginning, um, with Brian's graciousness, just the way that he handled our wedding and, and guided us through that process and going through marriage counseling with the Estringas. 
Um, we had a very um, great first impression of Meadowbrook, just their love and their uh, welcoming mm -hmm. um, attitude. So uh, ever since then, once the doors opened up again <coughs> and we didn't have to watch online all the time, we were here and uh, we've been here since yes, then. So. That's great. So tell us what studying Romans has, has meant to you over the last year and a half. So um, ever since I've been saved, uh, I got saved in college and um, from the get-go, I was, I was really, um, I'd like to think I was someone who was bold, someone who was not ashamed of the gospel. And so I always um, love Romans 1.16, mm -hmm. which is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. And um, that just always resonates with me in, in different ways and different seasons of life. And the job that I work, I work in landscaping, I'm outside long hours, and I have these tremendous opportunities with people that I get to work alongside with to just have these really long form conversations about anything. And as it would happen, I try to work the gospel and Jesus in whenever I can. And, um, you know, like currently I'm working with someone named Juan Carlos. And we go way back, we light trees, we're doing this and that together. And um, we have just, we've probably spent 20 hours mm. talking about his beliefs, um, which are unchristian, although he grew up in a seminary. He went mm. to a seminary, which is very fascinating. Um, and then just sort of juxtaposing where he's at with what the Bible says and just really fruitful conversations. Mm. And um, like further down in Romans 1, it says, you know, they've, subs they've worshiped the creation rather than the creator. And with JC, that's the case, right? Mm -hmm. So he's, he does that. Like there's a God for the wind and there's a God for the corn and, and this and that. And, um, but it's great because, you know, we get to use that. You know, he, he respects nature, right? And so do we. We want to treat it well. So we can find common ground but then we can also draw distinctions. And I just think, um, you know, being unashamed and knowing that God has, has made it so that the gospel is what people need. Mm -hmm. um, so just being unashamed, knowing that, you know, I'm not just conjuring up this story. It's, it's the truth of an almighty God yeah. to a lost people. Yeah. That, how, how are you finding that he's, he's receiving both what you have to share and you in the midst of those conversations? I mean... You know, and I think you've done a really good job in some of your sermons, just not just saying the words, but being someone who, you know, they look to as a friend, someone who they mm -hmm. find credible and friendly. So, um, you know, the last thing I want to do is toot my own horn, but like, I, I'll, like his car's broken down, so I'll give him a ride home after yeah. work. And just like making it not just you know, the theology, but trying to live a life that shows that right. it has changed my life as well. Um, and I think he's seen that. And, you know, he's asked me more questions than I've yeah. asked him, which to me is always a great sign of sort of a mutual respect of, yeah. um, you know, we're, we're both after something and, and let's talk about it. Yeah. So. And when it comes to like reaching out and sharing the gospel with people, like people need to know that you actually care about them. Like you actually want a real relationship with them. Like I think people are pretty good at sniffing out like, oh, they're just like trying to proselytize me or whatever. But like when you really care for somebody and you really desire to be in relationship, like that's when you start to find, you know, uh, doors open up and walls drop. And so how have you found um, that you have been challenged to think differently about the church yeah. by studying Romans? Because there's a lot of talk in Romans about a church being divided or right. not be, there's not peace in the community there. So how has that challenged you to think about what it means to be the church? Yeah, it's, it's something I've really needed um, in my walk. Like I said, I kind of, you know, God sort of set me on fire, whatever word you want to put. Uh, um, but from the get-go, I've been very um, direct and almost too over the top mm -hmm. and... Um, more preachy, like uh, just saying it without regard for maybe the relationship or something. So I've really had to come sort of a long way of um, just trying to to be bold, but in, you know, seasoned with salt and grace and just understanding that um, 
you know, Paul does talk a great deal about unity in mm -hmm. the church. And, um, you know, it's, it's known that we're not going to agree on every single thing. So I think um, putting aside my pride that I know everything about the Bible and, you know, my word is, is the ultimate truth. I think just being more gracious and meeting people where they're at and, um, you know, trying to share maybe what, you yeah. know, they need to hear at that moment. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so last question then, as you have studied, as we have studied Romans, how has this study helped you process and impact your perception of the scriptures as a whole? Because Paul oftentimes reaches back into the Old Testament to bring things forward and really is showing how it's all connected together. Yeah, I mean, if I, if, if I pick one thing, I guess it would just be the the necessity of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Like it is, it is God's redemptive plan that we would have faith in Jesus. So um, trying to be gracious and loving to a world who doesn't proclaim faith in Jesus, but also knowing in the back of my mind, even like in Romans one, like we we're saying that, you know, those who, you know, don't believe in God, but they still know God. There's, right. a, there's a knowledge of God in every single human being, um, and God has made it that way. So I think just approaching it, knowing that we may not think differently, but um, almost trying to just spiritually excavate mm -hmm. that truth from being suppressed to the surface. And just like happened with me and probably everyone else who's been lost and then, you know, been shown the light. So. Um, just trying to to live a life, trying to share the truth, and hopefully bring those yeah. people to the light. Yeah, that's great. Well, thanks so much for all that you had to share. I really appreciate it. Can you guys say thanks, thank you man. to Jeff? <clears throat> and then why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Okay, I feel like my posture is going to be on show here, like how terrible it is. So right. shoulders back, right? <laughs> right. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> Um, I'm Julie Kalp. My husband, Jesse, and I started coming in to Meadowbrook um, about as long as we've been in Romans, right. actually. Right. I think <laughs> A that's little beginning. bit longer than yep. that. So we joined last summer, and we have three boys. Um, we have two older boys in, the, in elementary school, and then we dedicated Wesley this mm -hmm. summer. Yep. He was the one that nuzzled on your shoulder. Yeah. So sweet. It was sweet. So sweet. It was a moment. So yeah, um, and I've gotten involved in tapestries and then um, recently joining the music team. And my husband is on the prayer team and on the mission board. Yep. Is, that, is it called yep. the board? Yeah, yeah. Okay. board, team, group committee. of people. Committee. Committee, yeah. yeah. Meeting, right. yeah. <laughs> so as you think back, like it's interesting that you say that. You started here right around the time that we jumped into mm -hmm. Romans. And so this has kind of been your Meadowbrook experience has been Romans. So well, how has that been? Honestly, I feel like it was like, totally God-oriented in so many ways because first off, like, we were transitioning from ministry background. Both my husband and I had lived in ministry worlds and worked in ministry worlds. And so for us to find a church home was, like, a really big deal to both of us, like, finding somewhere where we could both feel home. And I feel like Romans was really pivotal into entering into that because, like you said when you were talking with your dad, that you can't sugarcoat Romans. Mm -hmm. Like, it just, like, hits the ground running and goes. And it confirmed what we had felt about attending Me uh, Meadowbrook and visiting um, in that summer, that Meadowbrook is willing to be a countercultural church. We're going to have those tough conversations. We're going to engage um, one another in that dialogue. And Roman starts off just, like, hitting hard with theology and having really, really tough questions. Right. And there were really questions that within our family dynamic, as my husband has married into a single mom with two boys, when, you know, we have an interesting dynamic that speaks to a lot of Romans one and two. Mm -hmm. And so for us, like we had already been, got onto the parking lot after our first few weeks and was like, wow, this is it, isn't it? Like we turned to each other at the same moment. This is home. And then, um, then when that sermon happened in early September, too, we left the room saying, gosh, this is going to be a church not just for us but for our kids. When the tough dialogue has to come, we're willing to have these conversations, especially in a cultural climate that doesn't say, 
there's one truth or that love is defined by God and mm -hmm. his sacrificial love mm -hmm. um, that creates a lot of confusing dialogue. And so it was affirmation for us that not only would we find a home here for us as a couple, but like our sons too would be yeah. invited into that rich dialogue as well. Yeah. Yeah, and, and as I think back, like, you know, that conversation with my dad where he's like, oh, teach through Romans. I'm like, if I could somehow skip Romans 1, <laughs> like maybe, yeah. because Romans 1 is tough. Mm -hmm. Like there were, there were weeks where people would be like, oh, I read ahead, and I wonder how you're going to handle next week. And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm like honestly so glad you did because I think it would be really easy for churches to do that. And so many churches do do that. Yes, mm -hmm. I said do do. Sorry, do -do. mom again. Yeah. <laughs> Um, they do that, and, and that's really difficult because, you know, like even as, Roman goes, as Romans goes, there's in the middle, we talk about Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life, yeah. and that can't be denied, and so we should be transformed. There should, yeah. be, um, there should be a difference in how we live yeah. as a church versus how the world functions. Yeah, and I, I think that's a, a lot of what Paul's trying to get at, because once you get to the end, and he's talking about the division totally. in the church, and mm -hmm. uh, somebody first service said that what a divided world needs is a united church, mm -hmm. right? And the, the, the world needs to see that, oh, we might be different, mm -hmm. and there might be things that we disagree on, even within our body, but what they see continually is the love of Jesus, both in us and through us, mm -hmm. that changes their perception of what it means to walk in faith. Yeah, and, and even living in that tension of navigating what often the Christian circles deem as black and white, mm -hmm. and being able to walk into that tension and that space of entering into dialogue through honoring the relationship and bringing dignity yeah. to the individuals in that room and having that mm -hmm. conversation. We see that the gospel isn't just like this one-time thing, like Jesus saved me and then I'm done. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the ongoing revealing work of Jesus in your life throughout every circumstance, throughout um, every story that God leads you through. Yeah. So as you think about uh, this last year, is there one part, I mean, you mentioned Romans 1, was there anything else, any other parts that really stood out to you as like, oh wow, that's hitting me in this season of my life in a way that's really profound for how I actually live my life? Yeah, so, I mean, my husband and I have had like amazing dialogue as a result of this sermon series, which I've really appreciated. Um, but, you know, something that I've been really wrestling with as I've entered into clinical work, I'm, I'm training to become a therapist, and so I'm in my clinical hours and I'm starting to do that, and something that um, always hits me or hit me a little different about Romans 8 was when we talk about um, all of creation groans, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so the idea of the gospel, like I said, not expand, or not just limiting it to Jesus, which is the pivotal moment, that's the climax of the whole narrative, but also incorporating and understanding that like every part of ourself as a human groans. Mm. Not just like the morality issues of black mm -hmm. and white, but like my physical body, mm -hmm. my mental emotional state, mm -hmm. like every component of my life groans and waits just as the whole earth does. Yeah. And so being able to enter a room with somebody who doesn't necessarily work from that worldview yeah. or um, doesn't know the hope of being able to... I don't know, allow the Holy Spirit to be an active agent in that dialogue one-on-one -on -one, yeah. and knowing that the gospel is something that we, we can see God's healing in every aspect of our life, yeah. not just this morality issue, black and white, but this and every component of our life. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, the quotes that I wrote down and put on a little sticky note and put on my wall in my office that came from a commentary on Romans so the, it said that the world's sense of guilt today is not as profound as what it maybe was 20, 30 years ago, right? Like, so we, we've moved away from, as a culture, a category of sin, mm -hmm. right? Like, people just don't think in terms of sin. That doesn't mean sin doesn't exist, but the world doesn't think in terms no. of that. But he said, but the world has a profound sense of hopelessness. Mm -hmm. And so maybe what at one point in time was the sense of guilt has now, for people, it's a besetting groaning and aching of like, where's the hope? Yeah, and C.H. Wright, um, in his book about um, the mission of God's people, mm -hmm. he actually talks about that, that the only way that we can relate to maybe on some end with um, people 
who do not believe in God or do not believe in the gospel is that the world is not as it should be. Yeah. And I think that's like a really pivotal picture is we know that there is a hope found in Jesus Christ and we know that truth. But how do we cultivate that in relationship? And I think so much of that starts in the church Mm -hmm. with being able to enter into those dialogues and live in the tension amongst one another so that we can go out and be a transforming agent in this culture that doesn't know truth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so we get to be the witness. Like, that's totally. what Jesus calls us to be. You are witnesses of the hope, of the truth, the light, and the love that and, Jesus has. And entering into that dialogue is actually an opportunity and moving people through things are not as they should be to unco- uncovering what it will be yeah. one day when Christ comes. Yeah. Those dialogues actually facilitate God's love yeah. when we live in that tension. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you sharing all of that. And thanks to Chris and Jeff and to Anne. Can we just say thank you to them one more time? Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite the, the worship team to come back up, and we're going to finish by singing one more song before we close. But, but my hope is that like, what this morning does is it gives you just a little snapshot into ways that people have processed working through a book like Romans. And the great thing is, like, you have the ability to do that, right? Like, there are more resources today, not just on the book of Romans, but on the Bible in general, and that when we come to the scriptures with this assumption that there is power in these words and that the Spirit of God is alive and active as we open the pages of scripture— We come with this expectation that, oh, we get to encounter God and meet with Jesus and be transformed by his word. It gives us this sense of like, like, why wouldn't I continue to read and engage in the scriptures? Because as Paul says at the beginning, like, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The, The gospel being the good news because it is the power of God. And we have access to that power through Jesus, through his spirit, through the scriptures at our fingertips every day. So thanks again to those who who shared. Uh, Let me pray for us before we sing our final song. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you so much for the revelation that we have in you through your word. We pray that as we continue to study your scriptures we would find that it transforms us, that we would seek to submit ourselves to your word in order to be mastered by it so that we could look more and more like your son, Jesus Christ. I pray this in your name. Amen. Well, please stand with us.